Hello, and welcome to Read Scholars Live. I'm your host, Dr. Mary Fleming, and current president of Read Scholars. Today, I am super excited to have our guest, Dr. Mark David Monk, who is an emergency physician, healthcare executive, and new author. How are you today? I'm terrific, Mary. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Thank you for being here, and, and we're really excited to talk to you and explore your career and also the new book. So um, I usually like to start with just getting to know a little bit more about you. So we know you're an emergency medicine physician, so tell us a little bit about your journey to medicine. Sure. So, so yes, I trained in emergency medicine many years ago. Um, I practiced clinical emergency medicine for a number of years, um, and at some point, and this is really kind of what the book gets into, um, there was a a moment when I recognized that I no longer wanted to or could do full time clinical emergency medicine, and I pivoted into healthcare administration, mostly working for organizations that were trying to deliver healthcare in new and creative ways. So that's really been my path for the past ten years. Um, all the time, I'd kept the journal of my work in Africa when I was a, a younger doctor, and the time felt right to actually get out those notebooks and put pens of paper and get this book finally written. So the book is Urgent Calls from Distant Places, and it's coming out um, today. Um, Path to Medicine, you know, it's in it's in the book. Um, you know, interestingly, I had really no intention of becoming a doctor. Uh, I, <laughs> uh, it was, I almost fell into it accidentally. I was, uh, I went to college in upstate New York in a small school, and uh, I was really a humanities major. I didn't take a single science class for four years. And accidentally, I fell into the volunteer ambulance service. So like many small towns, the town that the college was in, Colgate University, happened to have a volunteer ambulance service in town. They were looking for volunteers. I volunteered, and really the rest is history. So at the same time as I was taking humanities and thought that I would become a journalist, I was also volunteering uh, when the, whenever the pager went off for mm. emergency calls. And uh, when I got to the end of my fourth year, I realized journalism was not the right path for me and that what I really needed to be doing was medicine. And I had to go back and take all the science classes. And I started med school late and ended up in emergency medicine. So that's my path to healthcare. I, I, and, and you know, um, interestingly enough, my one of my worries for this year, because we're starting a new year, is serendipity. So it sounds like you had a serendipitous path into medicine. Um, and But it's interesting that even though you went that way, you came back to um, the, the journalism pathway with, with writing a book. So that's exciting. Um, you know, one of the things before we get to the book, and, and as you said, you, you started out in clinical medicine, realized that wasn't the, the path for you and kind of moved away into the, the healthcare executive role. Um, and we, and a lot of our listeners are, you know, some students trying to understand how do you negotiate medicine? How do you really affect health outcomes? And sometimes that's not with direct clinical care. Um, and, and how do you know when to pivot? And it sounds like you had kind of a, a, a aha moment, if you will. And then what do you pivot to? So can, can you give us a little bit of insight into that transition for you? We won't spend too much time here, but that, yeah, I think that would be yeah. helpful um, for our listeners. I, I get asked a question a lot. And so, uh, you know, I when I decided to go into medicine, I was sure that I would be a bedside doctor for my whole career. I mean, we there were very few models for what you would do other than bedside medicine. And so, you know, when I did medical school and then I did residency, I did fellowship, and I found myself as a young attending doctor in an academic emergency department. And I remember coming to work one day and looking around and thinking to myself, like, this can't be it, right? The, the entire healthcare system was broken. And, you know, as you probably know, what ends up happening when the system is broken is that it all funnels down to the emergency room. So no matter what the malfunction is in the system, whether it's inability to put patients into a skilled nursing facility, there's no beds or they don't qualify, whether there's a lack of primary care, uh, whether patients have socioeconomic issues that prevent them from accessing regular care and they have to come after hours, whatever the issue is, it ends up in the emergency room and you're ill-equipped to deal with a lot of the stuff that comes through. I mean, these are longitudinal primary care issues and you feel kind of helpless as an emergency doctor. Um, there was one example of a patient actually, it's kind of a I always remember her when I think back to those days, but it was a young woman, probably with with psychiatric issues, but um, came in with somatic complaints, frequent somatic uh, uh, abdominal pain regularly, nausea, vomiting. 
And we would see her regularly. She was a fixture in the ER. We would see her almost every night. She would come in if you were doing the night shift. And because we rotated at various hospitals in town that were part of different healthcare systems, we had access to the electronic record in different systems. They didn't speak to each other. Mm -hmm. And at one point, we ended up looking her up on all three systems and realized there were some days that she was in different ERs three times because oh, this was really, it was for her a source of entertainment. It was uh, uh, a way that she could feel cared for. Um, there were a number of reasons why she was there. But the shocking thing about that story is that when we counted the number of CT scans that she had had for her abdominal pain, they were in the hundreds oh over gosh. over a number of years. I mean, it's because the one system didn't speak to the next and she had a concerning story and she got worked up and nobody really knew her and there was a new doctor every time. And, and, and so you looked around the system and you realized the system is so fundamentally broken. I mean, no matter what metric you use to measure it, and you know maybe you're, you use the quadruple aim if that's your your yardstick. There are many yardsticks that you can use, but no matter what yardstick you use, it doesn't work for patients. It doesn't work for caregivers. Access is awful. Cost is awful. And the emergency room is where it was all landing. And at the same time, emergency medicine was um, really beginning to be in the clutches of private equity. Uh, they private equity were buying up a lot of groups. They were putting unreasonable productivity demands on doctors. Uh, there were really unscrupulous things having to do with billing and patients' responsibility mm. for healthcare. And so I suffered, as to say in the book, I suffered what I thought in retrospect is moral injury, although we had no words to describe it at the time. It was 2008. And I realized that after all these years of hard work and sacrifice getting to becoming a doctor, I, I was so disappointed by what it had turned out to be. And I needed some time to clear my head and think about what was going to happen next. And that's where Africa comes in. So the book really gives a little bit of that narrative and then talks about this transformative experience uh, of spending a couple months working in Africa on a on an air ambulance. And it gave me space to think and kind of pivot. And, and see what's next. And I think, you know, I, and many of us, I, myself included, kind of, one, understand that, um, you know, we know that we, we you have to take care of people in real time. People have emergent issues that really have to be taken care of. But we also know that, um, to your point, they end up in the emergency room or lots of other places. And that's not the appropriate lane of care because right. their other needs are not being met. Um, and so I think that's a, an important point to underscore. And, I, and <laughs> even though you're talking about experiences with 2008, nothing, unfortunately, has really changed oh, in the advances yeah. there. And so, um, so transitioning, so you had your clinical uh, experience and now, okay, we're, go we're going and we're going to have a transformational experience and you decided mm -hmm. to do that um, internationally. So tell us first, like, how did you even find this experience? Like, how did you decide, I want to go with this group and, and they're going to take me to this place and, and I'm going to do... Uh, medicine on an air ambulance. Like, how did we get from A, B to C? <laughs> so I, I had done air ambulance in the U.S. The, the good news was that the program I had done residency at was really quite well known for its air ambulance and ground ambulance training. So I had spent some time in the air, uh, and I just threw the grapevine. It was another one of those good luck things. Uh, somebody I knew knew somebody who happened to have been a, a pilot with this small group, and they connected me, and it turned out that they were looking for doctors to come on this exchange program. So the idea here is that you bring on some doctors uh, from, from Europe, from North America. They bring in best practice, new practices. There's an information exchange that takes place. And so I sent an email, and you know, fortunately, there happened to be an opening within a month. And I sent in my resume, and they got back and said, absolutely, please come. And, you know, in retrospect, I mean, I, I should have known about the Flying Doctor Service because it's it's really an extraordinary institution. It's been around since the 50s. Uh, and it's now part of AMRIF, which is really one of the largest African-led NGOs um, in the continent. Highly effective, really good at what they do. But they'd been good at air ambulance stuff since the 50s and 60s. And so it, it was a pleasure to go join them. And so I picked up. I realized that I, I really wanted two things. I needed some space to reevaluate my decisions and my career and what I wanted to do next. Um, and I really wanted to start practicing a much more intimate form of one-to-one -one medicine, mm. which is what you can get for these extended transports in Africa. Uh, so, so that's how it happened. I, you know, within two months had a Kenyan medical license and I was in the back of, of aircraft flying out of Nairobi. We were going to 11 different countries in East Africa over the period of my stay there. 
typically what happens is that uh, if patients are sick and they're in, in many cases in small county hospitals or very rural small small hospitals, they'll call AMREF and say, we have an emergency evacuation that needs to take place. And AMREF will dispatch a doctor, the flying doctor service will dispatch a doctor and a nurse and a pilot and an aircraft, depending on the size. And so if, mm. if you're on a rural airstrip someplace, we'll send a bush plane. Oftentimes we would send a small jet that would collect patients at the larger cities. But these were the sick of the sick patients. Um, many tropical illnesses, a lot of trauma, cardiac issues. Uh, we would stabilize them, really provide ICU level care, and then bring them back to Nairobi, which has some of the best care in Africa. You know, Nairobi and, and South Africa are really the two centers for healthcare. Yeah, and and, and with, as we were talking earlier, I spent time right outside of Nairobi for a few years, and I think the um, even as challenging as their healthcare system is, it's it's super robust in in different ways, right? And mm -hmm. um, where I was was about four hours from Nairobi, and, a, and two of which hours were on a dirt road. So it's better now because they actually have a, a paved road that goes from Nairobi all the way to Mombasa, but um, but the level of services and how they disperse their regional health care is, is very coordinated. And so mm -hmm. it's it's very clear where you go when you have to escalate service. And the airstrip was, you know, walking distance from the hospital. So if something like that happened, mm -hmm. thankfully we didn't have to <laughs> yeah, evacuate yeah. anybody out yeah. while I was there. But, um, but you know, but there was a, a definitely clear escalation of, of healthcare services in that area, and um, much more robust than I think than people really realize or think about when you think about um, care internationally, especially in East Africa. Um, and so, so you were there, and you were um, having this intense, I guess, personal um, healthcare delivery experience, um, and then. You know, I'm sure. And one of the things I really wanted to do when I went there is to really understand how healthcare is provided in different settings. And so, as a you know, I'm, I identify as a locum physician, right? So I've worked in many different mm -hmm. um, healthcare settings in the U.S., but I also wanted that global perspective and understanding, especially when you get to super resource poor areas. How do you still um, provide very excellent care, which which happens and which they did. So tell us a little bit about how you learned about the healthcare system from a very different perspective, if you will, from the U.S. Uh, you you raise you raise some really I think the key questions about this whole experience, right? So there was some cognitive dissonance, I have to say, mm -hmm. um, on this experience. I mean, uh, as you say, um, Kenya has always been very good at providing the basics. Like there are county hospitals, there was um, decentralization that happened a number of years ago that took responsibility from the national government and put it down at the county level, which was actually very effective because um, the clinics were now better staffed and the equipment was better, et cetera. And so primary care, vaccinations, those sorts of things have always been quite robust. Uh, the, the Kenyans have figured that part out. Um, where they've struggled was was emergency services. And, and there was a kind of an interesting Interesting dynamic in my time in, in Africa in that affluence had caused the change in the demographics and affluence had caused the change in the types of cases that we were seeing. So whereas I would say 20 or 30 years ago, you had patients with malaria or, or other infectious diseases, typically they weren't extremely time sensitive. Like you needed to get to the clinic within a day or two to get your malaria medications. Um, but there wasn't anything to the you know that that was so sensitive to minutes and hours as there was as as Kenyans became more affluent right so they developed diabetes they started developing much more heart disease right we at AMREF went to get a number of patients with, with really severe myocardial infarctions and had to bring them to the hospital that was a question of getting an airplane there within hours to save their lives the same thing with trauma you know as as Kenya became more affluent cars were better roads were better road traffic accidents were much worse and trauma, as you know, is one of those things that has to be in the hospital within an hour, you know, right. and, and mortality starts to increase if you delay. So was, there was, the, you know, this 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 changing changing demographics um, that really lent themselves to air ambulances and made the air ambulances and infrastructure much more important than they had been in years earlier. Um, but that create, created kind of an interesting challenge, right? Because here you are in an air ambulance. These things are millions of dollars, right? These, mm -hmm. these aircraft. Um the amount of equipment that we had around us 
was hundreds of thousands of dollars. The best pumps, monitors, drips, medications. Um, the staff were all expensive. Uh, and, and so there are these times in the book that I recount where you land sometimes in these county hospitals to pick up a patient who's sick and needs to be brought back to Nairobi. And in one memorable scene, you walk into this ward and my patient was at one end of the ward and all eyes were on this patient from across the room. There was a, it was a hallway mm. of... 10, 12, 14 patients equally sick, but they weren't getting evacuated. I mean, there right. was there was barely enough. And it it really raised some important questions, which is, is this really how you want to spend the healthcare dollar? Is it is it worth spending hundreds or thousands of dollars on a single evacuation, hundreds, thousands of dollars on a single air evacuation when $10 would make such a difference to, to many more patients? It's a thorny problem. I never really had a great answer for this. Uh, as I said in the book, it really depends who you are. I mean, if you're the one who's been hit by a car in a field, uh, there is there is nothing that matters more to you than seeing the AMREF airplane land and the doctor coming out and stabilized and being brought to Nairobi. Uh, I wasn't equipped to make those kinds of rationing decisions. I don't think that was my role. Um, but it raised certain certain questions, right, about about how to spend healthcare dollars and who makes those decisions. Yeah, you know, and and, and saying that I. I think in the U.S., you know, we can often, to your point, kind of operate in our little bubble. Um, and when we do, you know, and I think the importance of having these experiences that take you out of your comfort zone, that take you out of your typical practice environment, and, and we're saying this as physicians, but this can relate to any field, right, out of your normal comfort zone. And you can really see things from a different lens. And I think for me, I did recognize the, um, the disparity seemed much more pronounced when I was in Kenya, right? And mm -hmm. seeing that um, the difference in, and even going from like Nairobi, where like a, it, for most of the time, you, you feel like you're in New York City, right? It's mm -hmm. bustling, it's metropolitan, yeah. you, you have anything you want at your, your fingertips. And then, but you go a few miles down the road and you see stark poverty. And it's like, mm -hmm. how do these things exist um, in a country that has so much affluence? And you, and you just see it, I think it's just such a much more sharper image, I think, when you're out of your everyday comfort zone. And so I encourage people to get out of your comfort zone so you can kind of see yeah. things that way. Um, but you also raise this kind of question of, of really ethics, right? Like, how do you mm -hmm. decide who deserves care and how do you distribute resources and what makes sense and, and how do we spend healthcare dollars? And I I don't I don't have an answer either, but I think it's a it's a great conversation to have and one that we probably don't have uh, as much as we should, because, you know, to your point, at the end of the day, most people are just trying to do um, the thing that's going to get them from day one to day two. And it's mm -hmm. hard to think of these mm -hmm. these big picture things. So um, so going back to your experience, so you're there, um, you're providing care. You're you're seeing things from a different lens, and um, tell us about your your length of stay, and how did you decide how long to stay, and like when to come back? Yeah, so uh, each of the tours is a month at a time, and you're basically on call for 24 hours a day. Um, so we, we flew every day, sometimes two flights a day. Uh, so that was in 2008. Um, I then went back to the U.S. Uh, and we'll sort of talk about the punchline, which is a, a pivot <laughs> into administration. I don't want to give away the punchline too early, but the, that's the punchline. And then I went back in 2012 uh, as I was getting into administration for a second tour as well. It was a really interesting time in Africa because, as you know, uh, there was a rise in um, in extremism coming out of Somalia uh, starting around 2008. There were terrible terroristic bombings of of, of malls and uh, and churches and public spaces in Kenya. And there was a very, very distinct difference in feeling uh, between 2008 and 2012. So you'll see it in the book. Actually, 2008, there's almost an innocence uh, to those cases. There's, um, we're you know we're sent out uh, to get a tourist with malaria. There's a, a young lady with diabetic ketoacidosis that we bring back. Um, there's a priest with a heart attack. Uh, actually, there was an intervention by the bishop of Goma. Thank goodness, because we were. We were going to be in, in hot water from people. Uh, we landed in Goma to pick up this priest, and the bishop intervened. And, you know, uh, saved our bacon, which interesting story. But as you get into the latter part of the book, the second tour of the book, um, we're suddenly flying into Somalia. I mean, we we had to go pick up African Union soldiers uh, and land in Mogadishu, which was incredibly treacherous. Um, and 
you know, we pick up these African Union soldiers, many of them who've been starved because the rations that the African Union was providing weren't sufficient and they had uh, nutrient deficiencies and just w sort of one dark story after the other. Um, a lot of engagement with the American military, which shocked me and was gave me some pause. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I don't think a lot of people know that the Americans had really sent drone bases and military bases and and kind of put them all through Africa to try to control this extremism. Uh, and, you know, it, it leaves you a bit uncomfortable. Um, and you'll see in some of the stories in the book uh, of coming across soldiers who'd been hurt, uh, American soldiers. And uh, you, you realize that you're sort of in a continent at war. And it, it, there was this, this loss of innocence that happened in a short period of time. And so... As I say, oftentimes, the book is really about three things. It's the story of me. Uh, I'm not all that interesting, but it is the story <laughs> of me. It's the story of AMREF, which is an extraordinary NGO uh, with a really interesting history going back to the 50s. And in some extent, it's a story of Africa in this strange period of time between 2008 and 2012. Uh, yeah. And and we, we talked briefly, you know, when I was there was many years later, not many years, but five years later, and you could still feel the effects of that time. And and they talked about the mall bombing. And I think it's okay to go now. You know, so it was still still the it's it's okay. You can go. I think it's safe. But um, and for me, the other thing was interesting. Um, going to the mall, and there were armed guards at the mall with you know, I, I'm not a gun person, so it was it looked like a massive gun, some type of rifle or assault rifle. Um, you yep. go through a metal detector to go into the mall. So really, to your point, it took away that innocence. You can't even go shopping, right, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. without this um, security presence that's at such a level higher than anything that I'd ever experienced before. And so it's, you know, I guess it makes you feel safe. <laughs> Yeah. I'm not sure, yeah. Um, yeah. but it, 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 I'm glad you brought up that point and how, how mm -hmm. things can change so quickly. And I, I mean, I guess we have the, you know, when we think about, I was thinking back to um, the other day I, I, when I was doing um, some temporary work back in college and it was around 9-11 and that was when TSA was evolving. And now TSA is a part of our everyday lives, but there was a time that we could just you know, go to the airport and walk through the, we didn't walk through the metal detector, but um, yeah. my whole family would go to the, to the gate with me when I went to college. And, and that was just part of our existence. And now, mm -hmm. you know, things change. So um, things change. So I get that. Okay. So you've had this experience and now you're back. And so what do you do with it? How did you so, digest it and, and make that pivot? What, you know, what I realized was that, uh, I had an important role to play in trying to fix the system, right? I, I I didn't have any particular management skills at the time. I had to go back to school to get some of those. But I felt strongly that I could try to engage with the system and try to improve the system. Um, I, I, I sort of deeply understood even at that point in time that there were so many deeply entrenched interests in American healthcare that to try to fix the system from within was probably not going to work, right? The academic medical centers, the pharmaceutical companies, the PBMs, you know, everybody has such a strong financial interest in maintaining the status quo mm -hmm. um, that to my mind, the only way to do it was actually to step outside of conventional healthcare and try to come up with creative new models that might be interesting. Um, I was very attracted to this concept of value-based care and capitation. Um, my sense was, and I, it still is today, that uh, fee-for-service is really the ultimate poison in healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, it's It really creates absolute misalignment with uh, everybody, payers, uh, patients, healthcare providers. Uh, and so there needed to be a different way of paying for healthcare. Uh, and I was fortunate to live in Massachusetts at the time. I took a job here in Massachusetts. Uh, it had always been one of those places where value-based healthcare and capitation were always uh, well well done or had been done for a number of years, California being the other. Uh, and I started to realize that when you look at these alternative ways of paying for healthcare, uh, you know, where you where you give physicians a, a fixed amount of money to care for a population and hold them responsible for the costs and outcomes, it was a much better alignment of interests. And, and so really one of my first jobs was working for a capitated physician group as a, as a healthcare executive. And then I went on to work for a primary care startup in Boston called Iora Health, which was mm -hmm. founded by a terrific uh, primary care physician called Rashika Fernandepule. He's a, a visionary and a genius. And he came up with this 
really high touch model of healthcare uh, that leveraged health coaches and created a, truly a home for patients to get healthcare. Um, and over time, we've migrated into this Medicare Advantage uh, capitated model of healthcare payments, where we were responsible for all of the care these patients were receiving outside of IOR's walls. But it forced us as the primary care physicians to be much more thoughtful about uh, where those patients were going and what types of service they were getting. And so, you know, that was an example of the kind of healthcare that was just a dream or she could dreamed it up. And it ended up creating a creating a tidal wave. And you know, now I think next generation primary care is becoming really a, a phenomenon and it's improved care for so many people. Uh, but it was only through that getting outside of the traditional system that those kinds of innovations were possible. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think a lot and I speak a lot about the uh, reimbursement system that we currently work in and how it is. It doesn't really serve us well mm -hmm. as physicians. It doesn't serve our patients well. Um, but there, to your point, um, you know, people are really stuck in maintaining the, the status quo and that change process is just so hard for so many people. And I don't think it's necessarily from a point of um, malfeasance, um, but it's just, you know, how understanding how to do something different and how doing something different can have such exponential results as, as you're talking about mm -hmm. um, and taking care of the whole person. Right. And, you know, we talk, talk about the sick care system. Right. We take we, we put band-aids on things. We fix things when they're broken but we don't actually put a lot of effort in taking care of the whole person. And to your point, like what happens outside the walls, right? And when they go home and uh, creating an environment in which people can be healthy. And, and yeah. That doesn't happen in the doctor's office or the, in the ER no. or the operating no. room. And, um, and how could it with five minute primary care visits? I mean, right. I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm really challenged by the morality of the American healthcare system. To my mind, there is there are people in Africa certainly who go without healthcare, but there is an honesty. I mean, it's a cash pay economy for much of healthcare, but it's 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 a it's affordable for many, and it's quite transparent as to what the costs will be. And there's a certain ethical yeah, there's a certain sort of ethical standard there that's being met in Africa that, frankly, we don't meet here in America. And there are so many people at the trough, as you know, uh, who charge the maximum that the market will bear, whether it's pharmaceutical companies, whether it's medical device manufacturers, whether it's administrators, whether it's insurance companies, whether it's uh, the people who create layer and layer and layer and layer of paperwork. What's ended up happening now is that you've got healthcare premiums for the average family in America that are over $20,000 a year with with massive copays. Yeah. And people get these surprise bills for for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's frankly unethical. Uh, there is, you know, there's, there's no place that wastes as much money in administration as the United States. And so at the same time as we are delivering really poor access, poor patient experience, poor provider experience and quality that's middle of the road, um, you know, we're charging more than anybody else in the world and living with that, right? And, you know, you brought up the, the transparency of healthcare costs. So I, that was another thing that was super interesting to me when I was working. So I working in a, a, a rural hospital, um, religious based, a lot of these hospitals in rural places are religious based, which, you know, that is what it is. But when you came, it was, a, it was it, you knew how much it was going to cost, like they told you before you accepted the treatment. And so you, you wrestle with that, like, oh, well, you know, you don't want to deny treatment because somebody can't pay. But at the same time, if it's a if, if it's emergent, you do emergent things, right? We know mm -hmm. that. But mm -hmm. if it was something that was not emergent, then people knew what they were getting into and could make that decision. And so I wrestled with that a little bit. But at the same time, when you think about what you just said here, you go into a place, <clears throat> you get services, and then you get a bill later, and you have no idea what you signed up for. You have no idea what the healthcare costs are. Uh, we think about the the premiums and looking at the exchange and you know deductibles are so high co-insurance and co-pays are so high and you don't really know i think we don't uh, really have the, the health literacy to actually understand what that means until we go and we have something um that we need to get addressed and now we have this big bill right um and and that's, that's super challenging. And to your second point, we spend all this money, we have all of these exorbitant healthcare spending costs, and our outcomes are still worse. Like and and getting and getting worse. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not like they they've been stagnant, and some of them are even getting worse in the recent um, the recent few years, which is is very disheartening and frustrating. So, I mean, I guess thinking of you know where we are now 
um, you know, what do you, what do you think, what do you think we can do better? How can we, <laughs> how can we do this better? Uh, you know, I, it's, it's a terrific question. I mean, I wish I had a great answer for you. I mean, the, the truth of the matter is that I've done this now for a number of years, this thinking about new models of care and doing things differently. Uh, there are times when you think you're making leaps forward and then you take a look and you realize that you haven't advanced much. Um, you know, the big article yesterday in JAMA uh, about the effectiveness of a recent primary care program called CPC Plus, turns out it didn't make much of a dent at all for a number of reasons. And so there, this was a program that we had really hung high hopes on uh, of being able to improve the quality of primary care, and it just turned out not to deliver. And there have been a number of examples of, 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 of healthcare like that. You know, I think fundamentally, unless the chassis has changed, I think there's two components to this. I mean, one, there has to be a policy uh, piece to this. Um, healthcare costs have got to be regulated. I mean, for us, uh, you know, Americans are now ordering medication from Canada. Why is medication cheaper in Canada? Canada's got policies and regulating the cost of, of medicines. Uh, we specifically prohibit uh, Medicare from negotiating uh, drug costs. I mean, that's that's something President Biden is working on as we speak. But, you know, so there's definitely a policy component to figuring this out. And I think without a commitment to, to, to regulating healthcare more rigorously, policy is not going to change and the incentives aren't going to change. Number two, there's been such consolidation and big business getting into healthcare mm -hmm. uh, that I, you know, and these are big businesses that are unabashedly profit seeking. Many of them have uh, uh, are publicly traded companies. They have shareholders. They've got to come up with quarterly dividends. They've got to make increases in share prices. You know, they have no incentive to decrease the cost of healthcare or reduce utilization in any way. So, until we figure out those two things, we're very much at the mercy of the system. That said, I don't want to be a nihilist. I mean, I, somebody said to me, is, 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 the book, is the book a bummer? And I said, like, like, no, the book's not a bummer. The book, I, 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 I hope, you know, you leave feeling kind of optimistic um, when you finish the book. But listen, I've, I've learned to never underestimate the United States. I'm, I'm an immigrant uh, to this country. I, I came from Canada uh, when I was a student. And um it's it's been an extraordinary place. You know the, the the opportunities that you get as an American are just second to none, right? Um, and so I've learned not to underestimate Americans. <laughs> I think you know the amount of innovation uh, coming out in in sectors adjacent to healthcare, whether it's you know tech or whether it's uh, AI now, I, I think is going to really start to transform healthcare and and drive down waste. Um, but it requires, I think, all of us to sort of. Put our foot down and sort of say enough is enough. I, I think, uh, and and that's going to have to be done at the voting box. I suspect. Yeah, and I, and and I'm glad you brought that up. I think we, and it's changing. But you know, I've gone to a lot of meetings, and I'm sure you have too. And we we listen to panels, and we talk about you know how can we make things better. We talk about innovations. We talk about interventions, mm -hmm. and they're often focused at the end user, right? How can we make physicians better? How can we make clinics better? How can we make hospitals better? But the reality is we're operating in a system that's dictated by these overarching policies that really mm -hmm. have to change in order for the end user experience to, to change. And so um, I'm seeing more of that in conversation and I'm hoping that um, we'll keep talking about that. And, and I think it's, you know, everything from reimbursement to malpractice to, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about Medicare and Medicaid, right? Those are huge payers <laughs> for, um, you know, a large uh, proportion of the, the U.S. And so until those type of um, uh, policies are, are shifted, it's really hard for the end user experience to be any different than it is. And then you also talked about being in Massachusetts, which you know, in the healthcare lane has been very, I mean, in other lanes too, but being very progressive over the years, mm -hmm. right? They, they've done a lot mm -hmm. of things. But we also have to remember that a lot of healthcare policies are very local and very state driven. And so, you know, understanding what the laws are on your local level and, and how to address those and speaking about those are, is, is also, a, um, I would say, a charge for our listeners to really understand what the, the local um, policies and procedures and laws are that dictate healthcare outcomes in in your local arena and, and challenging those. Mm -hmm. And so, and I guess in thinking kind of next um, after that, so we have, of course, many people in the pathway um, who are coming um, with us and behind us, and, and even some of us, some of people who are in front of us who were just kind of 
to your point, kind of opening their eyes to what's kind of going on. What, how do you encourage people? What's your advice? Like what, um, as people who are interested in making change, what, what would you tell them to do? Yeah, listen, I'm, I'm really heartened by what I've seen in this next generation of students. Um, you know, these millennials, they're, they're not like us, right? There's a, <laughs> they are not. <laughs> uh, there's just a difference. So what's, what's interesting is twofold. I mean, one, uh, what millennials have done to healthcare education has been dramatic, right? I think uh, those abuses that we used to put up with in training, those, you know, 24 hour shifts, 30, uh, you know, 40 hour shifts, don't, don't be, don't be honest about the number of hours you've worked, but, you know, uh, the sort of abuse that we tolerated, uh, it's just not tolerated anymore. I mean, the millennials put their foot down and said, we're not prepared to deal with that. And so there has been, to my mind, a dramatic change in the way that we educate young doctors uh, for the better. And I think you're going to start to see the same thing in uh, healthcare practice. Um, I think this is an unusually engaged generation of, of young people who have a very strong sense of right and wrong and, mm -hmm. and a really, really strong sense of social engagement. Uh, and I think that they are, you know, I think that they're going to push us into the next generation of healthcare. It's, um, it's a smart, engaged, young, idealistic. Uh, I have great faith in this next generation. Um, you know, I'm, I've, I've got probably you know, 10, 15 years left in my, my healthcare career. Um, I'll keep pushing, but I think the real change is going to be sort of the next generation of, 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 of students and residents who are getting into the field and really passionate about uh, righting the wrongs that they see around them. And that's just so encouraging. Yeah, yeah they are. I, I agree. I mean, it is an interesting conversation. And, um, you know, my my godchildren are 11 and 13. And Lord, if I got, them, if I got that wrong, y'all forgive me. <laughs> Um, but, you know, just the conversations are just different, right? They're much more insightful. They're much more thoughtful. Um, I think they're, they're much more willing, to your point, to challenge the status quo just because it's the way, you know, when we were going through training, this is the way we've always done it, and this is the That's way right. you will do it, too. And we were like, well, okay. But they're, you know, to your point, like, no, well, just because it's the way it's always been done doesn't mean that's the way that we should mm -hmm. continue to do it. And um, just really being thoughtful about the process and, and trying to figure out the best way for everybody. And so I am too, I, I, I am optimistic uh, uh, with the next generation and what they have to offer. Um, and hopefully we can create the space to let them flourish. I mean, I, I guess I am somewhat, um, I don't know, disheartened by that part. I, I think some of the things that we're, the, the, the current and past generations have done have not created the best environment to flourish. So hopefully we can, we can work on ourselves in the process. Um, and so I, I guess the, one of the last things I will ask you is... Can I make it just a quick point on that, Mary? One, sure. one thing I did want to say, though, and I, I forgot to sort of say this, I think that physicians, the system is not going to get fixed unless the doctors become engaged on fixing mm. the system. And I think for too long, uh, we've we as doctors have learned medicine, right? The science of medicine, the biology, the physics of medicine. The truth of the matter is these days to be a well-rounded physician who wants to fix the system, you need competence in finance and you need competence in politics and leadership. Uh, and without those things, what ends up happening is that the physicians get pushed aside. They put finance people in and they put operations people in and the physicians have no say at what happens. To my mind, there is nobody better prepared, better equipped to advocate for patients and to advocate for a better system than the physicians, but you need the skill set to do it. Yeah. So my, if, you know, for, for anybody listening to the podcast, who's deciding how should I structure my training? How do I spend my elective time? Figure out finance. It's really important. You need to learn how to read a spreadsheet. Uh, you, you absolutely do because otherwise you get into a leadership position, even if it's your own practice and somebody's going to pull the wool over your eyes. You got to learn, you got to learn basic finance and basic spreadsheets and how to run a business. And you have to understand how the sausage is made, right? Yeah. You don't just show up to work, clock in and clock out. You have to deeply understand the provision of healthcare, how it's done. So those are two critical skills. That's my only advice. Yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> and and I'll give a, a plug for Dr. Reed, for which Reed Scholars is named. And so the mm -hmm. fellowship program was designed and it's a leadership program. Um, but one of the things she required, we do have, we had a lot of choices that we made. One of the things she required was um, biosex, accounting, and economics, right? And to that point, you've got to know, you can't um, leave your trust in all the 
administrators, if you will, on how to run the business of medicine. Like we need to know for ourselves. And so you don't have to be an expert. You need to be able to read the spreadsheet. You need to know what's going on. You need to be able to do your checks and balances. Um, and and I, I think that was, I, I'm glad you inserted that. I think that's a, a great point and something that um, has been historically lacking for medical school training. Um, I think people, I think there's some schools that are doing better now, but I think we do need to make a concerted effort. And I think the other, to your other point, and the other thing that we don't do is organize as a group, right? And so we go, we see our patients and we, you know, we might be on a committee or something like that, but we don't truly organize as a group to have influential um, decision-making power on things that don't just affect us as as employees or as physicians, but then they affect our patients. And we know medicine, that's what we know, like we, <laughs> at the end of the day. And um, I think, uh, I, I do think that's a big gap in not having that voice and these very important policies that um, have such a significant impact on, on healthcare, healthcare outcomes, healthcare spending, you know, we can go down the, down the road. Um, okay, so bring it, bring it. <laughs> Bringing us back because we could uh, we could get we could get real deep there. Um, thinking about um, again being more optimistic and thinking about next steps. So you, you gave a little bit of advice. Um, I guess you know you mentioned AI as kind of a, a potential, and, and I get a little I, I, I admittedly get a little scared of AI. Like you know it has so much promise, but you know it could be a little dangerous. But um, what, are, what are the promises that you see as far as looking at healthcare going forward? Is it, is it technology? Is it policy change? Is it um, organization? Is it education? Is it more emphasis on population health and public health? Like, where do you, where do you think the best path forward if we were to harness our collective power? Where, where would you center that? Gosh, I mean, uh, don't make me choose amongst my favorite children. I mean, I, I, you know, all all of those things are incredibly important. I, you know, AI is an interesting question, right? If if you believe what people are saying, this will become the biggest disruption since the advent of the internet. And it's easy to see in healthcare, which is a which is a field. Medicine has been a field where we've been encouraged to memorize since yeah. since the books were written. There's a story in the book actually about. Um, Actually, I don't want to ruin it, there's, but there's a story there of like of, of medicine that was uh, developed in the 1800s that's just kind of followed its way through every textbook and actually turned out to be powerfully useful in one particular case in Africa of an overdose. But um, but but generally, we're you know we're encouraged to memorize all of this information, and of course, it's outdated by the time you memorized it, and and medicine is changing so quickly yeah. that it can't, from a factual basis, from a practice basis, it can't help but be better with AI that has access to every paper, every written. Uh, but you know, do you see a future where uh, patients will be receiving treatment from a computer, right? That will listen to your complaints and then spit out some pills on the bottom? I don't know. I mean, I've seen I've seen this new um, a company in New York that's coming up with these these kind of pods that you go into and you you know talk to a computer and uh, you know diagnoses you. And I, I don't think that's the way this is going to be. I, I suspect that the future going forward will be physicians assisted with AI. Um, the most obvious example is let's do away with typing, right? Mm. So, you know, can, can we have, can, can we have a device that listens to the medical uh, visit and then prepares the note in 10 seconds and it's ready for signature? I mean, that, that seems like a no brainer. Um, can you be, can you deal with difficult diagnoses and have AI kind of help you work through the parameters and the information in the, in the record and come up with a suitable diagnosis? I think so. Um, but it's interesting. I mean, if, if you've ever been sick, the one thing that you really want to have is a one-to-one -one connection with a provider of healthcare who knows you sure. and that you can confide in and that you trust. Um, so I, I don't think, I don't think doctors are going anywhere anytime soon, uh, but I think we will work differently. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> to go off on a different tangent, which we won't, but Thinking about um, trust in the healthcare system is a whole nother conversation too. Mm -hmm. And um, even as people access um, healthcare and how they access, where they access it, and that trust component. And, you know, I, I agree. I think there are things that um, AI can do to make it more efficient. Um, I think there are even things that can make it more accessible. Um, I, I was at the health meeting this past fall 
and you know explosion of, of AI informed uh, interventions and devices and these pods and type of thing. But um, you know, I, I do wonder if you get out of there with a sense of like, can I can I trust this or not? I don't mm -hmm. know, you know. And and then you know, thinking about follow up and continuity and um, you know, next steps. I, I think that um, you know, those are all things that are in consideration. And so you know, to be to, to be determined, right? We, we're, yeah. we're still very early. In, in um. So, you know, you, you, you referenced the book again. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about being an author, which is, it sounds like a title that you're not quite used to yet, right? Well, so, we're talking about that. I mean, how do you, how do you, Mary said, how do you want to be introduced? Do you want to be an author? I'm like, well, I, you know, it's my first book. Uh, it feels like stolen valor a little bit, uh, calling myself an author. But but yeah. yes, uh, yes, the book the book is 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 being released on January 30th and I will be a published author as of January 30th. So, I mean, you talked a little bit about, you know, journalism at the early part of your career. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, I just have to ask, like, what gave you the gumption to say, you know, I'm, I'm going to put a pen to paper or fingers to the keyboard and put this story out there for the world to see. How did you get to that part? I, I had kept a blog in the early days in 2008. Um, you know, uh, personal blogs were sort of a big thing back then, and I, I kept the blog. And, and so as a consequence, I had great notes, um, and I recorded every detail of these visits. And as I was getting a little bit older, uh, I realized that there was just a treasure trove of really interesting information in there. I mean, they're, they're, they're weird stories. There are 22... The book is really divided into 22 missions. Uh, each of them is a different patient with a different problem in some oftentimes strange places. I mean, it's middle of Somalia. We were in Congo. We were in Ethiopia. Uh, I realize in hindsight that some of these are sort of strange stories. I mean, there was, as an example, we went to Ethiopia to pick up a patient with severe diabetic ketoacidosis, really, really sick. And... Uh, there was this enormous amount of bureaucracy in Ethiopia, which I hadn't expected, but we had to stop in the capital on the way up. We went to the small town. We got stopped again. There was an official. They wouldn't let us out of the airplane until the suitable official showed up. The suitable official showed up. We, I mean, there was regulation after regulation. We finally got out of there. We ended up back in the in the uh, capital city, and they said to, we said, we need more IV fluid. We're running out. We're delayed, and it was impossible to get IV fluid because it was contrary to a policy. And the thing I realized about Ethiopia was that the reason it's so bureaucratic is actually it's post-communist. It's only been out of communism for a number of years. It was a victim of the of the Russian uh, Cold War, uh, you know, and, and Ethiopia was, as a consequence, was communist for a number of years and is still kind of battling that post-communist Eastern European mentality to a certain extent. But I thought, what an interesting story. Like you, you, I never knew that it was post-communist. I never knew what it had done to the national psyche. I never knew how it would affect patient care in such a direct and dramatic way. And so I, there was just this good stuff there. And I, um, as I was sort of thinking through my career and what I wanted to do next, and I realized that oftentimes looking forward, uh, the most helpful thing to do is to look backwards and kind of realize how the pieces have lined up. And I realized that this time in Africa for me was this, this pivotal moment. It was this opportunity to create a sacred space to listen to my inner voice, um, to convince me that the life I was living was the one that I ought to be living, right? Mm. And I think so often we can kind of get off track and you find yourself in these funny situations where you weren't really meant to be. Uh, and it's only by taking time away um, and really listening to yourself on what I call the frontier in the book that that you can kind of understand that you're in the right place or you're not and, and you've got to do something different. And so I thought it was just for various reasons kind of an interesting thing to do. So I, I pulled out the notes, I sat down, I forced myself to write like every day uh, for some period of time until this thing was fleshed out. And I got a great editor and she threw away half of it and we started <laughs> again and it's it's done. So That is exciting. I, I, uh, I, I like that. Live the life you also be living. Sometimes you have to, to recenter yourself. I do, mm -hmm. I do believe sometimes we get lost in the weeds. And, yeah. um, I appreciate that sentiment, and 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 I'll and I'll say again, I think it's so important to push yourself out of your comfort zone from time to time because I that helps. I think that helps recenter you. Um, and to your point, there's so much about the world that we just we just don't know. Mm -hmm. 
you know, for, for good and for bad. <laughs> Some things I don't want to know sometimes, but mm. um, I, we just don't know. And so I think until we get out there, we we won't know. And, and it definitely changes the lens in which we look through. So and kind of thinking about that. So we talked about how, where you started and mm. that pivotal part of your career and then how you came back and learned and grow um, from that. So what's next? What, what are you looking forward to? Well, uh, so I'm going back to school. <laughs> okay. Believe it or not, uh, I I am uh, I'm going back to become a fellow in hospice and palliative care medicine. I've been a healthcare executive now for over 10, 15 years, uh, and have done a lot of you know healthcare leadership things. And I decided it was really time to get back to the bedside in in really that one to one way that mattered so much to me in Africa. And uh, so I'm going back to be, I'm a student again, which is terrific. I'm really excited. I matched uh, and I'm going to be a trainee next year, which is fabulous. And when I come out, I think my career will be heavily bedside based uh, with some, you know, I probably can't stay away from the policy and, and uh, innovation pieces, but it'll be much more bedside focused than it had been before in a completely new field. Yeah. I mean, and thinking about the policies around end of life care, I mean, that's a whole, you know, that's a whole different conversation for a different day. Um, but, be but before we, you know, uh, get ready to wrap up, just for people who are listening, hospice and palliative care um, are words that are not necessarily uh, part of everybody's <laughs> everyday vocabulary. So just tell people what that means and, um, and put it in context. So put it together for what your experience was in East Africa and, and how that goes together just so people can put those pieces together. Sure. So, you know, hospice and palliative care, it's, it's really a philosophy um, having to do with advanced illnesses or, or end of life. Um, and really what it asks people to do is to be really thoughtful about getting in touch with what their inner values are about how they choose to spend the last, you know, years, weeks, months of their lives. Um, can we control their symptoms in a way that that makes their life more comfortable uh, versus just simply prolonging life? Um, to me, it's 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 an it's in a really intensely personal and uh, heartfelt specialty. I mean, if anybody who's had elderly parents who've who've been sick uh, and have been involved with the hospice system will tell you that it's just invaluable in helping you take an inventory and to come to terms with what matters to you in those end, end days. You know, as we said, the system is is incentivized to do more, always incentivized to do more. It's financially incentivized. It's incentivized by virtue of physician behaviors. They never want to say no and, and, and discourage people. But what ends up happening with patients with advanced illnesses, whether it's cancer or advanced heart failure, is that these patients oftentimes will spend the last part of their lives in pain, receiving treatments that really won't do anything for them, um, which may be out of touch with the way they choose to live their lives. And if you sat them down and said, let's take an inventory and have that discussion, they may answer differently. So to me, it's a bit of the contrarian work that I've done for, for much of my career, which is to try to push back on the system at times and say, is, you know, is what you're proposing in terms of chemotherapy and radiation aligned with what this patient in front of us really values. And what the patient may say is, you know, I this may extend my life by 10 days, but I would much rather spend the next six months of my life with my grandchildren or taking a trip or in my garden. And that to me is, is really humane and really to my mind, what medicine should be all about. Um, really getting in touch one-to-one -one with your patients and their values and, and delivering those things, not, not just simply prolonging life like we're some petri dish, right? It's, uh, so that's that's hospice palliative care in a nutshell, and and I think it's no matter what your specialty is, there are skills to be learned. Um, and yes, I have I have um, definitely benefited. Seems like the wrong word, but from um, hospice care and in, in, in my family, and so I think it's a it's an invaluable resource and and the right way to think about um, things that you're trying to do. So. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. And I, I do think it is uh, very fitting <laughs> in the flow of your career. It, it, it seems like it tracks well with you and how you have evolved and grown over the course um, of the past few years. So thank you for sharing. Um, but, you know, with that, I mean, I, 
I want to um, one, just thank you for coming and sharing your story. Um, I think I applaud you for putting your, you, keeping great notes, but also taking those notes and make it into a story that we can all learn and grow from. Um, and, that, and as we close, what are your, what are your parting words? What do you want the, the audience to know about you or the book or the future or what, um, what, you know, what do you want to inspire them with? <laughs> As we close yeah. our conversation. Listen, it's always hard. The, the inspirational final comments. I mean, all, all I can say, <laughs> I, I hope the book resonates uh, with people. It, it's it's my story. It obviously resonates with me. Um, it's something that I wanted to have on paper to share with my children as, as sort of a, a story that I felt was important to share. I hope by getting it out there, it resonates with um, others. Uh, you know, whether you're interested in Africa or strange stories or tropical medicine, or whether it's just the the very personal stories of people in severely ill, isolated, remote areas and sort of the importance of medicine and being a doctor to them. Um, I, I hope that resonates. Uh, I, I just, I think anybody who's training to become a doctor or is in the early stages of it, just recognize what a noble profession this is um, and how... Um, your career can go in all kinds of different ways. You can be an administrator, a full-time bedside clinician, uh, but this is a noble profession. And um, uh, I just encourage everybody to really, when times are tough and you're feeling down in your career and medicine's not going right, to take stock and just remember how important you are to somebody who's sick. Uh, yeah. So that's that's my inspirational comment, Mary. Um That's perfect. <laughs> I, I am not going to add anything to that. That was perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. For spending time with us um, and like I said for sharing your story and giving us wonderful words to live by so thank you thank you so much thanks so much for having me it's terrific thank you for listening to Reese Powers Live please follow us on Facebook Twitter or Instagram or subscribe to our YouTube channel